Hello, this is Father Rich. I'm here in the corner of my sitting room in uh, the second floor of the Rectory at Our Lady of Peace. In front of the statues, we've been here before, and some of the images of the saints. Uh, it's also a bookshelf that holds some of my fiction books, and it, 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 um, it has all seven of this next masterpiece, The Chronicles of Narnia, seven books written by C.S. Lewis between 1950 and 1956. Uh, I didn't get the whole book set until the movies came out, I think, in my priesthood, somewhere in the mid-2000s. Um, but I was very familiar with The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the second book of the series. I uh, knew the, the, the um, cartoon movie about it and had read the book. Um, and that's the one most people are most familiar with. I have my Aslan uh, little uh, image here that was given to me, the great image of Jesus in that, in that series. Um, and he talks about C.S. Lewis in his, that the fawn, uh, Mr. Timis, I think is his name, was the first image he had in his imagination that he said, well, maybe we can make a story about this, this fawn with an umbrella in a snowy place, you know, with a, with a street lamp. And then it, it went from there, Aslan, the main figure of the Christ figure in the, in the, in the series, uh, kind of helped him get the, the, the main story going and the rest was history. Um, but they talk about how on the surface level, these can just seem to be children's books or the talk tales that have talking animals and witches and young boys and girls discovering their inner strength and courage, which is certainly what they are, but they go to a, they, um, go to another level. They say in the midst of this series, the stories, the reader's always aware that something magical, something supernatural might just break through at any moment. Um, so it's interesting because C.S. Lewis was a great intellectual thinker and writer. He went to Oxford. Uh, he actually loved reading books. He grew up in, um, I believe it was in Belfast, and then moved to England eventually, went to Oxford, was kind of recognized for his intellectual ability, loved reading books, had a knack for writing, but he was an ag agnostic in his early life. He talks about um, in some of the, in his first tutor, that it was his father's tutor, kind of reinforced this skepticism in him that he was really kind of an agnostic or atheist. Um, but eventually, through getting exposure to um, other writers, two of the ones that had a huge influence on him were George MacDonald and G.K. Chesterton, who we talked about already, G.K. Chesterton in this series that wrote the, uh, the Father Brown series. But um, as he kind of got more uh, exposed to them, um, one book that he wrote was MacDonald's Fantasties, Fantasies. It's spelled differently with a PH, but um, he read this book. He was waiting in a train station, had a long train ride. He read the whole book, and this started to kind of get him to start questioning his atheism um, to the point where in college then, somewhere in his probably 20s, he made the jump, they say in 1929, um, he kind of reluctantly became a believer. Um, jokes about him being the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England because he really didn't want to go there, but he couldn't help conclude these truths that these great writers were saying. And eventually, two years later, 1931, he became Christian. He became an Anglican. Uh, J.R. Tolkien became a good friend of his later on and really was pushing for him to become Catholic and really thought he was going to. Uh, C.S. Lewis never did, but um, he remained a very faithful uh, Anglican. You can go. We actually went to his grave when we went to England uh, over the summer. And you can go right next to the, his grave is the church where he would go to worship with his wife. They have a pew where marked off where they would, he would sit every week. Uh, and then they actually created a Narnia window right next to it as a way to honor him as one of their regular uh, members of their congregation uh, throughout in, in the 1900s. Um, but so we see this great use that um, Lewis had in the Chronicles of Narnia of kind of these simple stories to tell much deeper truths. Um, they say that one of Lewis's greatest gifts was to able to effectively embody the gospel in story, in myth, in analogy, and in allegory, so that we might see the truth with fresh eyes. He does this again and again in his writings. Um, so that was kind of his goal, was to give a, ver a, a different version of teaching the gospel through stories and allegories instead of like the, the catechism and the stained glass windows that was the normal way to teach, which he thought were not always inspiring or engaging. Um, 
So they mentioned that two of the great writers I already mentioned, uh, MacDonald and Chesterton, had on him in his conversion. And so he would go on to be one of the greatest great apologists, defenders of Christianity in England in the 20th century. Uh, he would write, write great kind of books. They weren't necessarily theological essays, but or they were probably essays, not real doctrinal kind of, you know, textbooks, but um, essays, just speaking in a very clear and common sense way, but with depth that really just spelled out why we believe what we believe as Christians. Um, and so he ended up writing quite a few. He wrote Mere Christianity in 1952, probably the book he's most well known for, and a very um, kind of straightforward, it's based off his wartime radio talks on morality and faith, but a straightforward kind of presentation of why Christianity is true. And just keeping it simple, mere Christianity, not kind of with all the, the fluff and maybe the layers that have been thrown on it by the institutional church, but just that mere Christianity. He wrote the Screwtape Letters in 1942, which he shows a profound grasp of the psychology of evil and temptation. The Abolition of Man in 1943 uh, warns about the dangers of relativism and subjectivism in modern thought. The Problem of Pain in 1940, his meditations on perennial theological puzzle, the nature of suffering and evil. And then he also went on beyond these apologetic works. He wrote his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, 1955. Science fiction, The Space Trilogy, between 38 and 45. The Children's Fantasies, The Chronicles of Nardia. Theological Parables, The Great Divorce, 1945. Literary Criticism and Mythology and Psychologically Rich uh, Novel, Mythically and Psychologically Rich Novel, Till We Have Faces, 1956. Um, so again, he became one of the great defenders of the Catholic faith in, in England in the, in the 20th century. Um, you know, they say that he, uh, he believed in the truth of the Orthodox creeds and he made these truths come alive for his readers. He managed to communicate with a combination of rationality, imagination, and a sense of the mysterious, holy otherness of God as few writers before or since have ever managed. So the Chronicles of Narnia, I encourage you to check out C.S. Lewis if you haven't gotten exposed to him. Certainly those stories are great for children, but adults, I think, can appreciate them. I forget who they said would read those once a year. Uh, someone famous, but I forget who it was. But, um, but also his other writings that are very good for adults in helping us understand and defend our Christian faith. So check them out. Um, our next one is a fr the friend of his I mentioned, J.R.R. Tolkien, The Lord of the Rings. Uh, Masterpiece 58. So hope you'll join me for that. Thank you for joining today. Have a great day and God bless.